Now we're thrilled to welcome Peter Ho Davies. Peter Ho Davies' latest book is A Lie Someone Told You About Yourself. His previous novel, The Fortunes, won the An Annisfield Wolf Award and the Chautauqua Prize. And his first novel, The Welsh Girl, was long listed for the Booker Prize. He has published two acclaimed short story collections, The Ugliest House in the World and Equal Love, and has been anthologized in Best American Short Stories. In 2003, Granta named him among its best of young British novelists. Born in Britain to Welsh and Chinese parents, he teaches in the MFA program at the University of Michigan. Peter, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me. I'm glad to be here. It's a special treat for me to have you here since we are former colleagues. Um, I really appreciate your making the time. Earlier in the episode, we talked to Gish Jen about her New York Times op-ed on changing views of anti-Asian racism and violence in the US. And The Fortunes is about being Chinese in America and has four sections. And one of those four sections is about the 1982 murder of Vincent Chin. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that incident. And sure. um, you know, Vincent was a... Um... Chinese American, uh, I think he was around about 27, and uh, he was in Detroit, living and working in Detroit, um, working as a draftsman, also working uh, weekends at a Chinese restaurant. And he was out on a particular evening with uh, three other friends, um, one other Asian American friend, a couple of white friends, uh, celebrating his bachelor party. He was due to be married about a week later. He was at a strip club in Detroit. An altercation ensued with a couple of um, uh, white patrons at the club. Um, uh, the fight sort of escalated from the club into the parking lot, at which point um, the two white assailants pulled baseball a baseball bat from the trunk of their car and chased Vincent and his Asian American friend. And they actually went looking for them around the streets of Detroit. Um, for about 30 minutes, they drove around looking for them. And when they finally tracked them down and found them, uh, Vincent, uh, in, you know, was caught by them and... Um, uh, struck in the head uh, multiple times with a baseball bat and ultimately killed. Um, he died later in, in hospital of his wounds. Reminds me, of course, of one of the most poignant details of um, the assault on Vincent is that the men who attacked him were angry about Japanese imports of cars and mistook him, even though he was Chinese American, uh, for the target of their Japanese rage, I think, in some ways. Um, it's a sort of shocking story, not just for the violence, uh, but also for the legal aftermath that followed. Um, these men were able to sort of plea bargain their, uh, their convictions down to manslaughter. Uh, they paid, I think, $3,000 fines and court costs of about $780, and they never saw a day in jail for these crimes. Um, and that sort of... Um, provoked a uh, considerable outcry in the Asian American community and sort of was a kind of catalyst, I think, for um, the coming together of a kind of Asian American political movement at that time. Um, it's interesting. I was reading our mutual friend Beth's essay about Cobra Kai in which she actually briefly mentions this and I didn't realize the person who attacked Vincent, Vincent Chin actually never even paid the fine. Um, oh, I, yeah, I didn't realize that. There was a civil suit, you know, there were a number of suits. There was a civil rights case eventually, um, and then eventually even a civil suit. But I think even the findings in that haven't been paid. Um, so there's been this longstanding sense in which the family have never been able to get in any kind of justice or restitution. Yeah, I think it seems to me such a long aftermath. I was reading an interview with um, one of the with the older assailant um, on the Asian American Legal Defense Fund website last night. I was sort of reading up on this case and to listen to that voice and realize that the the long tail of this incident was really remarkable. Um, I wonder if you would read for us from that, there's a little bit of a section in here about kind of the coming together of the movements, which I think is really interesting. Yeah, and I should say the, the section in the novel is told from the point of view of um, uh, Vincent's uh, Asian American friend who was with him on the night, a witness to the assault. Um, uh, although in the book, that character is very much a sort of fictional imagination. In certain ways, I'm projecting myself into that space of the witness. But he was there at many of the um, the organizing movements that came after this point, of course, testified at the various trials. They call themselves the ACJ, the American Citizens for Justice. No mention of Chinese or Asian in the name, and insisted the placards that marches be in English, which may explain the painful plaintive pun of chin up for justice on one popular sign. But they're the ones, journalists, lawyers, church leaders, and local businessmen who helped Lily, that's Vincent's mother, get the case reopened. And they're coming together, Chinese and Japanese, those old enemies, as well as Korean, Vietnamese, Filipino, marked the start of a pan-Asian political movement. 
and me along with the rest, attending meetings, giving interviews, marching beneath a newly lettered sign. You could say it's when we became Asian American. Two drunk white guys couldn't tell us apart and we realized we were more alike than we'd thought. The first meeting was held in the Golden Star, the restaurant where Vincent had worked. Everyone sitting around the freshly laid tables, vinyl tablecloths and melamine rice bowls, trying not to disturb the settings, looking less angry or sad in that context than hungry. It reminded me of his funeral the previous summer, only these weren't all the same people who'd come then. I didn't know many of them, and many of them didn't know Vincent, and yet they spoke of that night as if they had been there, as if they'd been attacked. In a way, I guess they felt they had, if not by Evans, then by the verdict. Part of me wanted to say something. Didn't they know who I was? But then it came to me that all their talk of a heinous assault, a brutal slaying, wasn't the way you'd talk about it if you were there. That wasn't how I remembered it. That was how they imagined it. They weren't talking as if they'd been there, but as if they wished they had been. What would they have done if they had been, I wondered. And I held my peace. It reminded me of Vincent, the way he told me about his father's mugging. They were spoiling for a fight too. Back in the kitchen, the cooks were prepping dishes for later hot oil singing in the steel woks. I didn't say anything in the end, but Lily was there and she spoke last, halting but firm. She wanted justice for Vincent and we applauded until our hands stung. But a lot of the people in that room also wanted justice for themselves. Me too, I suppose. I had run, but maybe there was still something I could do. Sometimes now, when people tell the story, it's a triumph. Something good, something important coming from tragedy. The death of a man, the birth of a movement. I guess that's what Vincent was martyred for, even if he didn't know it. Thank you. I remember um, you came to Minnesota and read from this section before the book came out and the room was just totally stunned silent. Um, and back in the 80s, following the death of Vincent Chin, we saw the rise of Asian American civil rights organizations like American Civilians for Justice. And today we have senators like Tammy Duckworth and Maisie Hirono calling for deeper investigation into other Asian American hate crimes that might be left underreported, as well as calling for more diversity in the Biden administration, specifically cabinet appointments. Uh, so what are the chances that Atlanta and the other attacks going on around the country serve as a similar flashpoint for Asian American protest and organizing? question. I, I, you know, I'm not sure that I, it's hard to handicap those chances, of course. Um, I mean, I, I do find myself feeling some cause for optimism. Um, you know, one of the things that that section about Vincent speaks to is that it took a year or so to really organize um, American Citizens for Justice coming out of that space. And yet I feel like at this particular moment, there are a number of um, Asian American lobbying and political groups that are already speaking powerfully to these spaces. And we have more representatives doing that work as well for us as well. So I'm thinking of things like Asian Americans Advancing Justice, the Stop APA, AAPI hate groups um, who are thinking into these spaces. Um, and that does seem, I think, encouraging to me um, within the writing community, of course, there are uh, mobilized groups of Asian Americans, you know, not just in terms of thinking about politics, but also just thinking about representation to Asian American writers workshop or the Kundiman writing workshops as well. Um, so these things all seem encouraging to me. Um, and yet um, there are probably also some reasons for pessimism. I mean, we're talking about gun violence again here. And if the country can't move on gun violence when the victims of it are school rooms of children, we wonder about how much they can move on an issue like this, I suppose, in some ways as well. Um, I mean, I'd also point to the way that the case that I think about in regard to Vincent, when I'm thinking into the history of that case, you know, in 82, part of the pressures there that surrounded um, the attack on Vincent was the economic pressure on the American car industry from Japanese imports. And so this was in Detroit. The two men who attacked him were men who'd worked in or were continuing to work in the car industry. The line sort of famously that comes up from them is if, um, if it wasn't for you little motherfuckers like you, we would still be in jobs, right? Although actually one of them was actually still working for Chrysler. Um, so one of the attackers was a foreman at Chrysler, the other had worked for Chrysler. 10 years after this attack in 1992, Lee Iacocca, who was the CEO of Chrysler, had been the CEO of Chrysler at the time of the attack, was still talking about Japanese imports and he used the language, um, the ex ex exact quote was, the Japanese are beating our brains in. Uh, in an economic way. It's amazing to me to think about how that rhetoric can be distorted and perverted um, 
in uh, 10 years after this attack, which Lee Iacocca must have been very well aware of in that period. So there are moments, even when we think about the, the organization that came out of Vincent's death, when it's still possible to imagine great pessimism about the future along the way as well. Um, and maybe the other thing that I would say is for all that we need to think about organizing for all that greater diversity and representation. These things are incredibly valuable um, for greater attention to legislation uh, as folks in Congress are thinking about it, seem incredibly useful as well to me. There's also a way in which it feels as though we're trying to address a problem in the society and most of that address is coming from the people who are in the receiving end of that problem, the victims of that problem. Um, it also seems to me that that problem, um, you know, those are symptoms. We might think about the cure. We might wonder why it is that uh, people like the young man in Atlanta and people like those who are abusing Asian Americans in the streets and attacking them, why they are... I would say so hateful, but actually I'm going to suggest why they are so fearful. That feels like a problem for a, a larger part of the society to think into in various ways. And maybe it's all of our problems in those regards. Well, I think leaders and media play a giant role in this. And I think it's rhetoric. You know, I, it's been made, the point's been made many times, but, you know, the Trump administ administration rhetoric on othering people in particular peoples and on immigration generally is the cause. Period to me. I mean, and, and I we had an incident, similar incident happen here in, I live in Kansas City and in Olathe, which is a nearby city, there was a, an Indian citizen who was, who was in a bar and, and there's this guy, Adam Purrington, got kicked out of the bar because he was abusing this guy and telling him to get out of his country and he came back with a gun and shot the guy. Now, fortunately, this man has been sentenced to life in prison uh, and quite happily, it was by the Trump administration's Justice Department, so I appreciate that, but the Justice Department is not taking responsibility for the fact that I think that their president at that time's rhetoric, this happened in 2017, was causing that. Yeah, it's and that's one of the great echoes, I think, with um, with the Vincent Chin case. We go back to 82. I mean, I think the case of Vincent Chin sort of feels now as though it's a kind of landmark case um, in the history of Asian American uh politics. But I think partly because of that landmarking, it's easy to think of it as just a um a particular anomalous, grotesque moment. Um, but of course, it also comes out of a space of, um, well, two spaces actually that I think resonate with our current moment. Um, one is a space of economic anxiety. Well, we might think of um, the current uh, spate of attacks as being driven, I suppose, by um, some of the ways we think about the pandemic and some of the rhetoric associated with that. Um, the pandemic itself, of course, has economic um, repercussions. And I would argue that um, the othering of China and the Chinese feels like it goes back further than that and does come out of a deep economic anxiety. I think yeah. that, um, you know, there's a line of Donald Trump's that he offered up in 2011 when he was um, flirting with a run initially. He didn't actually run um, in 2012, but he was thinking into that space where he was asked, I think, in Vegas about um, uh, how he would deal with Chinese imports. And his language was to say, we're going to slap a tariff on this. But the way he said it um, was to say, we're going to listen, you motherfuckers, we're going to slap a tariff on your goods. <laughs> and of course, that word, that uh, that expletive is, um, is one that plays a significant part in the struggle and the fight that initiated Vincent's uh, assault and attack. And so it, the, that othering and the um, the violence of that language feels like it does feed into these territories along the way. And it's not just polit politicians. Now, I, I remember I remember the, the anti-Japanese panic of the of the 80s and, and early 90s when people in America, white people, thought that Japan was going to become economically superior to the United States, which seems now like a silly idea because they had a terrible couple of decades. But it was real, you know? And so everything that's happening now looks exactly like that in regards to China. Now, China has its own problems. We've done episodes on those. I'm not saying it's a perfect country, but I'm saying the way that America is reacting to China right now is very similar to the way that America reacted to Japan's rise and dominance in that period of time. Specifically, I went back and watched the Michael the, the movie Rising Sun from 1993 with Sean Connery and Wesley Sipes, which is the most insane racist movie I have ever seen in my life. 
And I remember watching it at the time and thinking that what is going on here? I don't know if you're familiar with that film or not, but I think uh, I saw it when and when it came out approximately. Oh I haven't God. seen it since. Okay. I was betting that you had seen this. It starts <laughs> I with a gong. I told when you had a large mental film vocabulary. <laughs> I mean, it does every possible cliche you could possibly do. It starts with this gong, right? You know, it's it, it has a guy singing karaoke, uh, you know, a Japanese guy singing karaoke to a white woman who like gets mad and leaves. He yells at her, instructs her to get in the car. They drive off. They should then they show a legend like Los Angeles, 9:46, 43 a.m., whatever date, and you hear Japanese voices talking. And they pan to a, a building that's in the background, a high skyscraper, and it's these Japanese guys are wanting to buy an American company. And they've bugged the room and they're listening to what the dumb Americans are saying. And they have all this power. And then the next scene cuts to like the naked white woman in her, in, in her boudoir, putting makeup on her neck and the Asian guy in a towel. You know, it's every, every most brutal cliche that you could possibly imagine about, about the ways. And I just, I can't even believe the movie was made. Did you end up rewatching this last night? I watched it last night. It is ridiculous. You have <laughs> you to told see me you were it. going to. Plus, Sean Connery's in it, and Sean Connery is in one other like terrible anti-Asian um, James Bond movie that's also yeah. insane. If, and if he's like redoing the role in his in his sixties. It was just a giant mess. But but that was setting the tone for something that was happening at that time. Yeah, um, and you were and saying I feel like, yeah. you were saying that's ninety three, right? Yeah, um, but the book was written in ninety two. Yeah, and so that's like 10 years or so after Vincent Chin. It's around the same time that Lee Aikoku is offering that line about Japanese imports. Um, but even in, in the build-up to the attack on Vincent Chin, there are bumper stickers in Detroit that's saying Datsun, Toyota, Honda, Pearl Harbor, that sense of a kind of rhetorical violence that leads to a kind of physical violence was very much there in the culture. And yet even after that attack and the publicity of their attack, 10 years later, the culture has not learned from that rhetoric. It seems to be the danger of that rhetoric as the movie seems to represent well nobody ever accused michael Crichton of being on time about anything <laughs> you know i am so like it's ridiculous you have to see it is a sentence that prefaces so much of my viewing um as peter knows um i think that sort of my memories of the depictions of asians from around this time are the karate kid and um short round from indiana jones um who was also sort of like right this he was so smart and charming, but also like mildly threatening, um, able to slip into all of these different scenes, uh, like very, do you, I mean, I think I'm, I'm younger than you all. And so like, I think I was, I mean, I must've been watching these things as a little kid. And I remember being so delighted. My brother and I were so into short round um, and so happy he was there. And now like looking back, I of course can't even watch these movies without feeling nauseated. Um, and like, this horror at my own enjoyment, like my desperation for representation was that I was so delighted by like literally everything except for Temple of Doom. Right, but that desperation for representation is worth thinking about it. We might be horrified about it in retrospect, um, but retrospect is always 2020 in those ways, right? It reminds me a little bit of the way I write about um, the Charlie Chan movies in an earlier section of the fortunes. And, you yeah. know, Charlie Chan at that point is played by a Swedish actor called Warner Oland in Yellow Face. And yet um, that character was beloved in China at that time, because I think, A, there's a, there's a hunger for that representation. And because the idea that he is the great detective who solves the crime and catches occasionally at least the white criminals um, made the character important, separate to who was representing the character, I think, to some of those viewers, at least. So our perceptions of um, what's beneficial or what's not beneficial do feel as though they're very much shaped by the times we live through. And our desperation for representation in our youths, I think, makes perfect sense to me. I'm, I'm glad I appreciate being retroactively free of this extremely bad day. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things we might think about is um, how will, you know, I think about this as a father, I suppose, in some ways, but I also think about how will generations in the future judge us, right? So we look back on the past and we can see these flaws. Um, but it, in all probability, 20, 30, 50 years from now, those who come after us will look back on our moment and not see it as particularly enlightened either. Yeah, I'm sure that that's That's true. in the nature of progress, one would hope, actually. I think we can be absolutely positive about that, especially <laughs> given the last four or five years. Our pandemic response isn't going to ring anybody's bells as being fantastic, I don't think. And I think so much of um, the depictions that you're touching on, and even like the pandemic, the way that people are reacting, there's so much... Uh, toxic masculinity associated with the pandemic response, this kind of nationalism, 
right? Like the people who aren't wearing masks are largely men, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then also, right, this kind of like you mentioned the naked white woman in her boudoir, like, of course, the subtle thread of like, quote unquote, are women, a phrase that I detest whenever I see it. Well, I um, forgot to ex explain, I talk about the sexual assault scene that came not long after that. Oh, so. God. Um, well, that intersection of uh, sex and race, uh, which we've, of course, felt and thought about a lot in the context of the Atlanta shootings, um, you know, is also somewhere in the Vincent Chin space as well. It's a strip club. Part of the altercation seems to begin uh, when there's some comment from the white patrons about how Vincent is treating one of the dancers, maybe how he's tipping her, all those kind of questions. Maybe there's even a way in which um, Vincent as an Asian man in this sexualized space might also somehow trigger something in those white men as well in certain ways too. So when you thought about, when you decided to write, The Fortunes has such an amazing structure, right? And it takes on this topic that can be articulated in an academic way, but it doesn't feel at all like an academic book. It's so, it's such a deeply human book that crosses so many spaces. It has so much scope. And yet it's also got these like really fine details. Why did you decide to write about Vincent Chin? I can imagine so many people like reading about that incident, just running for the hills, um, afraid to touch something that is such a tender incident. Yeah. It was the last section of the book that I wrote. It, it, it comes third in the book in, in its current formulation. Um, but I think by that point, I had become very interested in various figures who sort of represented uh, Chinese or Chinese Americans, um, and we're aware of their representative role in some ways. We felt the burden of it. Obviously, that's true for Anna Mae Wong, the first Chinese American movie star. Um, and I realized later, you know, not only that Vincent felt as though he was part of that progression. I think in some ways, um, you know, the iconic status of the case felt very important in those regards. But that also, in a broader way, and maybe this is that that personal or fictionalized element, the emotional element for me, is that um, as a writer, but also as a person, I have certainly felt moments when I struggled with my role representing other people who look like me, even though, you know, as somebody who's half Chinese, I feel like I am, you know, uh, uh, a not very adept representative of that culture, even though I'm seen that way. So we're always struggling with that space between how a larger culture sees us and the truth of who we are, I think, in some ways. And I felt like all those characters were doing that. So there was something of my own um, anxieties being channel channeled into those spaces, I think. It's really, um, I don't know, I just revisiting it for this episode, I just was reminded of how much I admired um, its scope. And we mentioned Anna Mae Wong. And so there's a section of the book that's about Anna Mae Wong, who of course, you know, lost film roles to white actresses, um, even when those roles were Asian, I guess it's the good earth specifically yeah. that I'm thinking of. And then there's um, like the, the character in the first section who's mixed race. Um, and then at the end, it, there's a section that um, kind of foreshadows in some ways, a lie someone told you about yourself. Um, and you've mentioned a couple of times, um, you know, as a father. And when Whitney and I were were um, thinking about inviting you on this episode before Atlanta happened, the original episode title we come up with these pithy things was rehabbing the dad. Rehabbing the dad. Wow. Okay, <laughs> that sounds like a large burden to be dealing with. <laughs> I think, and and um, I think you know, a lie someone told you by yourself is about fatherhood, and I, I think it's fair to say it's an invitation to reconsider how we think about fatherhood and. And masculinity in general, we've been talking about toxic masculinity and stuff. And the father narrator of this book is um, like the emotional terrain is so, again, so vast and so human. And, and um, it offers this alternative, it seems like when old models of masculinity seem obviously problematic, you know, again, going back to the shooter in Atlanta, blaming others for um, his problems. What, what needs to happen for us to get away from this model of masculinity? How does this get us to a lie? Well, you know, it's tricky, isn't it? It's, um, and, and a lie is a slim, and I hope in some ways, modest book, although it does sort of speak personally to some of the ways that I think about these questions. Um, it, you know, it's a book about parenthood. It's also a book that touches on abortion. So I was very conscious as a male writer about writing into what are thought of often as women's issues and not to speak for women, but maybe to stand with in some ways is some of the things I was thinking in, into. Um, and the character in the book especially ends up for a while working as an escort at a 
at a, an abortion clinic, I think, working through some of the things he's felt after he and his wife have gone through an abortion. Um, one of the things he grapples with, and I suppose one of the things I think about, um, you know, while we talk about maybe a, a more positive vision in the future of masculinity, um, he's grappling with older models, but in some ways also grappling with older models that from time to time, I think there's, there's maybe some value in those. I, I, I'm thinking about him grappling with a kind of chivalric model. You know, there's a part of the time when I hear people on the right talk about traditional values. And I'm like, well, you know what, traditional values that I was brought up with that include the ideas that if you're a man, you don't strike a woman. To, be, to do that is to not to be less than a man, I think, in some ways. And those are very patronizing, I think, in many ways and sort of problematic in some senses as well. Um, but if we were to revert to old fashioned values, maybe some of those would be useful to bear in mind as well. Um, and he's struggling, I think, with some of those spaces, but I think also struggling with the instinct to um, to fix things, the instinct to defend things, the instinct to ultimately to violence, I think, in various ways. And ultimately, the character has to sort of step away from that role because he can see that instinct sort of asserting itself. Um, you know, so when I think about some ideas of masculinity at the moment, I, maybe just because we're in this particular moment, I can't help thinking about um, about gun culture and how we might choose to redefine that culture, which feels like a culture of fear. To own a gun is to be afraid. To buy a gun is to be afraid. To carry a large gun is to be afraid. Maybe we should think about owning a gun as the equivalent of uh, middle-aged balding men jumping into you know, soft top Miatas, that it's a feeling or a gesture of weakness. Um, and maybe the culture needs to re-understand what it is to be strong, I suppose, not just for a man, but for a woman as well. I wonder if, um, so a lie someone told you about yourself came out earlier this year and it touches so deeply on some of the things that we're talking about. I wonder if you would read a little bit uh, for us from that book. Uh, sure, yeah. So the, um, as I mentioned before, the couple involves um, their first pregnancy, um, they get a very negative prenatal test result and choose to have an abortion. Uh, but then afterwards in their second pregnancy have a child, uh, but midway through the book, but begin to have some concerns about the child, um, some of his physical development, especially. And so this is a passage where they, um, the father is taking the child to physical therapy, to PT. The first time to PT, the boy asked, daddy, where are we going? A really cool gym, he called it, just for kids to exercise. It's going to be some fun. And in fact, this last part is not a lie. The boy loves these sessions, has a blast on the swings and the tramps. He's cooperative and attentive with the staff. The father watches, hovering, shouting encouragement, calling the boy buddy. Add a boy, buddy, like any regular dad, like it's sports, though in fact, the one time he signed the boy up for a class at the local Y, he stood by, teeth clenched, tight with worry. Now he's a PT dad. Their only previous attaboys were during potty training as poop coach and poop cheerleader. PT is really not as bad as all that. He almost forgets the sinking feeling all the way there. It's not so bad. There's nothing to complain about compared to some he sees in the waiting room. When the therapist asks, he's happy to say that no, they, the boy isn't fussy about his food or the clothes he wears or being hugged. More bullets dodged. But at the end, when she's writing down exercises for them to do at home, Cross crawl, bridges, crab walks, Superman, wheelbarrow, dead bug, more games we could play, he tells his son. She adds, almost casually, they should consider occupational therapy, sensory integration ther therapy, audio, auditory integration therapy. He might also look into orthotics if his insurance will pay. She shows the way the boy's ankle ligaments bow outwards, and the father nods and says, sure, and how long does she think the boy will need them? And she says, probably for the rest of his life. And he feels himself die a little in that instant, over orthotics, remembering the boy's first swaying steps, legs akimbo, arms overhead, tiny fists curled around their fingers, dangling like a puppet. He looks at his son and smiles brokenheartedly and says, okay, buddy, are you ready to go? Roger, Roger, he says in the robot voice of a battle droid. One day the father thinks as they drive home, I'll be dead, and my son will still be wearing orthotics and thinking of all the lies his father told him. Thank you very much. I am the father of two boys. Um, so the anxiety about children being healthy and wanting to take care of them is very familiar to me. But what I found interesting about your book is when I was thinking about, well, how many 
American literature is not filled with books about fathers thinking about how to take care of their children. <laughs> this is probably a good way of thinking about masculinity. And mostly right. it's filled with fathers not paying any attention to their children at all, you know, or doing things that are directly uh, bad to their children and the children telling the story. So I think of like Jeffrey Wolf's The Duke of Deception or every novel that Richard Russo's ever written or Sylvia Plath or Pat Conroy's Great Santini. I mean, so you're working in a totally different direction. Is that deliberate? Is that just how the book came out? Were you thinking about this other tradition when you were writing? How did that go? There is a long tradition of villainous fathers on the page. And, and if not villainous actively, then absent. So the, the, the gap they leave behind is, I think, very palpable in various ways. Um, although when I think about books about fatherhood, the one that always first comes to my mind, partly because um, the father in my book is also a writer, is The Shining, which is a particularly negative oh. vision. I think, of yeah. fatherhood, I think we'll put that right in there with those other ones. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, and, you know, we might, there are some more positive ones which we might talk about as we go forward. But I think um, when I think of a number of those books that you mentioned, Whitney, um, they also feel like they speak to something generational, a vision of fatherhood that feels um, maybe from the middle of the 20th century in some ways, right? And I, and I associate my own experience as a child of fatherhood as being associated with those kind of spaces as well. Um, you know, I, my father was a good father in many ways, but not a very expressive father, I suppose, in many ways as well, which is maybe true of, of men of that generation. And I, I began to think about this a little bit because I feel no um, hesitation or compunction. It's totally natural to tell my son I love him. He sort of goes, yeah, of course you do. <laughs> but it, it feels as though it comes very easily to me, even though I think um, for previous generations of fathers and men, it might have been harder to say those words. I, I, I realized at some point that uh, for my father, and maybe that generation, the way love is expressed between father and son is not through the word love, but through the word pride. I feel pride in you. Um, and, you know, that's an analog, I think, in some ways. We all, as, as parents, feel that from time to time. But it also feels like a slightly problematic one as well. It feels contingent to pride. You know, in the book itself um, only uses the word pride once, uh, but uses the word shame, the antithesis of pride, over and over again. It's where the title comes from. Anna Nin's line is that shame is a lie somebody's told you about yourself. Um, and I think that feels like a, a toxic space to be in, this desire to always be proving something to fathers. Um, we, my wife and I were just watching, um, I can't remember what movie or show it was, maybe it was a rerun of Lost, which we've been binging lately, um, in which somebody says to somebody else, uh, your father would want you to know how much he loved you. And it always feels like it's this belated statement, sort of beyond the grave in some ways, and also as though it will in itself be healing. Um, and maybe it is in some ways, but only because it's not been said during life, I guess. And it would feel like maybe we can begin to um, redress that space more as the generations go on. Yeah, I think that one of the things about the book for me is how it feels like the men, I mean, I think I as, say, as I say this, I realize how fortunate I am. It feels like the men I know who are fathers because, I mean, it's generational and it's also so, like it's um, how many depictions of there are who are of men who are interested in kindness in a really active way. I was thinking Speaking also- Speaking of old fashioned values, right? Let's hold that one up, right? Yeah. yeah, and I think I was also thinking about, I mean, that is connected to stereotypes of Asian parents. Um, Right. I remember when my book came out, I was surprised that I got a number of notes from specifically um, Sri Lankan Americans or Sri Lankans in the diaspora who were sort of like, um, thank you for putting nice parents in your book. Um, <laughs> like, I don't know when I've seen nice parents depicted. And I was like, I hadn't really done it on purpose. I just had done it. And they were so astonished because they had seen all of these depictions of like the sort of very rigid Asian parent. Right. And, you know, we know that, um, and I think this is true, for instance, in the anime Wong sections of the fortunes, that there are Asian pa parents who are very much bought into a patriarchal notion, right? So we can feel something of that um, authoritarian, uh, traditional family vision it played out in some of those spaces. Um, but it may also be inflected, I think, to some degree by... Um, a kind of master narrative of uh, immigration where we can feel like in a generational um, uh, tension between a, an earlier and a, and a later generation, I think in certain ways as well. But it's always important, I think, to cut against those, um, what become essentially like stereotypes of those relationships. Yeah, and I think even Biden, for all that he's not my fave um, for a variety of reasons, right? It was so interesting to watch the ways that people have talked about, right? There's like that image of him hugging Hunter Biden, 
and it the right sort of used that image and was sort of like what kind of man does this and I was like and and so many people on the left responded rightly I thought you know I mean like there's nothing wrong with hugging your son if you're just because there's there's nothing problematic here and there was this sort of emasculating um rhetoric going around which was so wild like and that that got still so much traction and like what connection as you say like what does that have to do with gun culture um like the guy who can't hug his kid and then you know grabs his shotgun or whatever from the back closet um as i'm concocting the stereotype i'm like but, uh, but, <laughs> but, but it, it, it reminds me that i think the sometimes the ways we think about fathers in the culture are shaped by um presidential figures right so fatherhood um you know it's something that we think about with lots of presidents over time um you know the last couple of course for sure but you know i think about maybe a slightly more positive book about fatherhood although it's a dark one too but it's one in which love i think is expressed i think about george saunders's lincoln and the bardo as being one of those spaces we yeah, think a little bit that's into a good that, example. Right? and that callback to lincoln uh, also makes us think about fathers as fathers of the nation right so we're often talking about founding fathers and pilgrim fathers so we're a, a father haunted um uh, nation i think in some ways as well i you know the the f- fixation on fathers in the culture and you know it it also happens because it is possible for a father to be a good influence. I mean, that's the thing that I thought was good about your book. My, I had a very close relationship with my grandfather. I, I duck hunted with him all the time. We, you know, I own guns, you know, but you know, he was a very gentle guy and a painter and sweet and could express himself and read souls and Neatson And, you know, was a, was a guy, just a guy, you know, lived in the Midwest, liked to play golf, you know, but, had a human side to him and could be very caring, but it was easier for him with me than it was with his sons. And I do think that sometimes it's the direct relationship with the son that's difficult. Yeah, I think there's something to be said for that. And maybe even just some of the ways, you know, I I noticed when we had my son and he was a baby, my parents uh, came to stay for a, a few weeks to hang out. And in the entirety of the two week visit, my father did not hold his grandson once, um, which felt sad for him, actually, but also made me think, huh, what does it say about my relationship with him? When did he first hold me when I was a baby in some way? <laughs> Something I would not have. Uh, good. And it wasn't, you know, a kind of like, I don't want anything to do with that baby, but just a kind of, um, I think a kind of sense of, oh, I'll drop him or break him, right? Some kind of masculine sense of clumsiness that has been sort of bred into him in some ways. And I think it was also um, hard for him to negotiate too. That's funny. That makes me think of Laurie Moore's terrific mother, which is a story that begins with a woman dropping a baby she's been given to hold. Um, And so, yeah. And we dropped to one of ours. And we feel such great incompetence, right? I think that maybe that's the thing. Parenthood is fundamentally a journey through our own incompetence. And men don't like to be seen to be incompetent, I think, especially. <laughs> Nobody does. But men, you know, that, again, maybe this thing about pride is creeping into that space as well. We, there's a vulnerability to that um, that we, uh, we can't somehow face up to. I never thought of that. I think that's a pretty good one. Maybe that's a good place to end. Peter, we really appreciate you coming on the show. And listeners, please don't forget to take a look at his new novel, A Lie Someone Told You About Yourself. Thanks so much, you guys. I really appreciate the conversation. Thanks so much for coming.